Peter Klein's wardrobe for the standard is provided by Sam Tanny and Son Tailors in Langley. Men's and women's tailoring. Sam Tanny and Son. Fitted for you. Fitted right. Welcome back. I'm joined once again by John Furlong, the CEO of the Vancouver Organizing Committee for the 2010 Winter Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, your father, I know, didn't, didn't live to, to see this, unfortunately. He died in 1974, right? Yep. Uh, shortly after, actually, his cousin was, was killed by... Uh, My cousin. Yeah. Oh, your cousin was yeah. killed uh, during... A, sort of, this is pre-IRA, but... but a, it was the same time. It was yeah. a, a terrorist bombing in Dublin right. and in 1974 a lot of people were killed including right. my cousin. My father had a heart attack shortly after. And, Do you think uh, that was part of the stress? Yeah, it was connected. It yeah. was a, had a, well, he had come to the city to uh, help identify her body and it was, a, yeah, it was very difficult and so we lost him at a pretty young age. I was mm -hmm. 23 at the time and, and shortly after that I came to Canada. Right. But the, uh, yeah, so I lost my dad. I would have liked him to be alive for this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. What, what would he have said? He wouldn't have believed it. Um, you know, my father didn't think that uh, there was a future in athletics in yeah. Ireland. Growing up in Ireland, it just everything and you was were amateur. Involved in athletics, yeah, I was, but it was all amateur. And uh, even though I competed at the international level, it didn't appear like there was a real. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't an opportunity-filled arena. Right. So when I would talk about being in, uh, involved in athletics, he would roll his eyes. But I think he would have been uh, proud, but also almost awestruck by the scope of what we we did here. And uh, but I would like to have had him there in the front row to see for yeah. himself. Yeah. Well, and, and sadly, you also lost Jack Poole, who yeah. um, was uh, the really, I guess, your boss, right? And hired you to. Mm. to yeah, Jack was the chairman. He was, I would say, the, the best friend I've ever had. Um, a fantastic uh, colleague. Uh, we were very good friends. Uh, we worked together on the bid, and then he went, we went on to d deliver the games together. And he was one of these very rare individuals that, you know, there's not many like Jack around, if any. And uh, he was a great mentor. He had a great sense of, um, he was a very humble man, but he had a great sense of knowing when the burden you were carrying was too heavy and he would lift a bit of it away or find a way to help, you know, take away the mystery to lower the mm -hmm. intensity level for you. And he's a great guy. We had wonderful conversations. Um, uh, I, we used to talk every day, but we had these especially great conversations every Saturday where we would talk about uh, everything that was going on. There was an enormous amount of activity um, mm -hmm. and he was, it was a terrible loss and, and uh, I'd never anticipated finishing the games without him. I we spent a lot of time at the opening ceremonies thinking what it would have been like to be sitting beside him. Uh, sure. He was a pretty funny guy too. He had a great sense of humor and so we, it was too, uh, too bad. And just as we were going to Greece to get the Olympic flame, um, I went to visit him in the hospital and it was pretty clear that Jack knew that he was slipping away and, and, uh, and I told him uh, when we were there that no matter what we would keep our promises, we would deliver the games that, that we, we gave our word to deliver. And But I had told him I was planning to come back and bring the flame to the hospital so he could be part of this when we got home. And, uh, and then of course a couple of hours after it was lit and we were on our way back, he, he passed away right. and uh, it was a big loss. And um, it was, uh, I mean, if you have a relationship like this in your life, you have a relationship. Yeah. Well, I guess partly because he, he died, but I think also it's because you're sort of a driven person. Uh, you you work crazy hours, certainly during the games, but up to it. I mean, there's almost a mythology built around John Furlong. And I remember a story that, that, that Catherine Gretzinger did on the CBC where she interviewed you at 4 o'clock in the morning, and she described how it was your third interview of the day, and your shoes were perfectly shined. And sort of thinking, I looked down on my shoes at <laughs> noon, and they weren't shined. I mean, wh what was your... Thinking back, I mean, was it was it crazy or? I mean, it sounds like you worked around well, the clock. I did, but I wasn't alone in this. Yeah. Everybody, no, I mean, everybody, I everybody was doing that. I mean, we basically lived this. Yeah. This is not something that you can put in a box and come back to it on Monday morning when right. you're feeling rested. It just kept on coming. And the people that, that uh, led the project who worked in key roles, they all lived it the same way. And I would say that for most of them, switching it off was next to impossible. Mm -hmm. So we didn't try to. I mean, we accepted it, and yeah. in, in many ways, accepting it is half the battle because yeah. it doesn't seem fair that you could that you know almost every second of your life is dominated by one yeah. thing. But we knew the stakes were high. We knew we had to succeed, and so we recruited people who had that kind of character. And right. I'm not sure it's a great thing to say about somebody that they're working at four in the morning and still working at midnight, but. 
the project was huge and it required a certain effort from a, a number of people and they were prepared to give it and the result is the result and I would do it again but I, I'm not sure I'd want to, to work like that for right. the rest of my life but I would I would say to anyone who was going to take on something like this your heart and your soul have to be in it or you don't belong. Right. But it does sound like, and I hope, I, mean, I hope this is not too personal, it does sound like it took a bit of a toll. I mean you have this sort of work family and, and, and you know with the George and Leisure and with Jack Poole but your personal family did seem to suffer. Yes. I understand yeah. you split with your wife during this this period of time. It was tough on my family although it's interesting my children I have five kids we've never been closer I mean for them it was transformational because I think they saw something that was actually happening that their father was involved in that's going to ch effectively change the future mm -hmm. for a lot of people and so I think for them it was quite something I think it was quite revealing I mean you know in the early days we were talking about getting the Olympics and your kids are going sure you will dad right nice try right. never going to happen at the end you know they're f finally taking you seriously and so but it was a fantastic relationship and for them I think it was a, a terrific thing to go through together and and as a family and uh, so while it was tough it was also uplifting and I would say as a family our especially with my kids they've come out of this uh, feeling very very lucky and well, your youngest I mean she was she must have been in she's, like she's, kindergarten she was 16 when it this year yeah oh. she was two when I right. start when I started um, and it, she's when I was pretty much lived her entire life yeah. she's known nothing else yeah. but the Olympic Games and and she actually uh, uh, was uh, auditioned behind my back to get into the closing ceremonies and got in and she was she performed as a dancer with a whole number of other dancers. She auditioned behind your back because she didn't want didn't want, want favoritism. Didn't want anything, didn't want me to know and then when I was trying to find I knew exactly what she was doing but when I would ask her you know what are you going to do in the opening ceremonies I can't tell you it's a secret I'm not allowed so but she for her it was a, a great experience and uh, to, to see uh, something like that up close and to feel the intensity of it so for her I think it was a bit of a lesson in life but but for the whole family it was I think for all of them it was dramatically bigger than they thought um, but 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 the effect of it bringing the family together was marvelous I, I loved watching it um, I, I these are my best friends in the world and yeah so it was great and I, I think for everybody that was working on the games they had similar experiences because they were away from their families doing and then right. at the end they, their families got to see them do something on at, at, on, a, on the world stage for their country I mean it's a rare thing to get to do so well, we have to take a short break but a lot more to talk about uh, after this break with John Furlong <laughs>